Good day and good afternoon. Welcome to Trades Tuesday. My name is Edith Broward Eads. I am an apprentice wig maker with the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and I am joined with my awesome colleague, Hope Wright. Today, we're going to be discussing hairdressing and barbering in Colonial Williamsburg within the black community. So please feel free to join the conversation. If you have questions, send them in. I'm going to hand it over to Hope for a moment. Yes, um, I hope I've been here for um, over 30 years um, at the foundation. Um, right now, I am um, an actor interpreter in the museum theater department, and um, particularly the study of the uh, material culture of free and enslaved blacks has been um, an interest to me since I um, started working here full time. And so um, some of the things we'll talk about today um, have come out of 20 plus, close to 25 years um, of research um, that I've done looking um, into descriptions of, of clothing, of, of uh, country marks, uh, jewelry, hair, um, all of those things. And um, there's still a lot to be uncovered. So even after 25 years, there's still a lot more um, to be uncovered. <laughs> Absolutely. And I would just like to add that uh, in the wig shop, our primary focus in the past has been that of the wealthy Virginia elite who are uh, going to be white men for the most part. Um, as this is a masculine fashion, uh, wig wearing is in the 18th century. So uh, well, quite a few of the, the resources that we'll be dis uh, discussing today are going to be from runaway ads, from uh, uh, imagery during the period. So I'm very excited about this today. It's gonna to be quite fun and enlightening to discuss something that has oftentimes, um, for lack of a better word, been neglected within discussing material culture and whatnot. And we do um, encourage your questions um, as well. Um, the bulk of my research, I would say, has come from um, runaway ads. And um, we have some examples of the Virginia Gazette, which there were several different editions um, published here in Williamsburg, um, but there were many papers throughout um, the colony of Virginia, through all the colonies and later states. And um, these were ads that were um, placed in newspapers by, by owners hoping um, to uh, retrieve people who had, had self-liberated. Um, so to have a better chance at doing that, you end up with some very detailed descriptions. Um, and they list a lot of um, you know, clothing items, they list shoes, um, but they list um, hair also. So colors, styles, mm -hmm. um, textures, um, length, what have you. And that's mostly for um, enslaved people. For free blacks, it can be um, a little more difficult. Um, once in a while, you come across a really great um, resource, like a, a book called, I believe it's Richmond, in uh, Days Bygone or in Bygone Days, that gives us a description of a Cy Gillett who for a time um, lived in Williamsburg and he was a free black violinist. And we know that he wore a wig with um, two side curls um, on either side of his head. But for the most part, the descriptions that we get of um, free blacks and their hair come from something that free blacks were required to do um, after the Revolutionary War. In the counties in which they lived, they essentially had to um, prove they were free over and over again ever so often by going to register um, at courthouses. So we get descriptions um, of, of usually it was people's, um, whether they were men or women, um, height, complexion, and off, almost always a description of their hair as well. So that's where the, the descriptions of free blacks usually come into play. Yeah, I think we've got an image of a uh, runaway ad for road. Um, that was placed within the Virginia Gazette. And this one's wonderful uh, because I believe it's, she affects gaiety in her <laughs> dress and she wears her hair high up on her head. So she's wearing it in a roll, somewhat what we might think of as a pompadour mm -hmm. uh, or you know, a hair cushion underneath. And I think that's, you know, within uh, Williamsburg, you're gonna have folks who are expressing their individuality and you know, they have some, sort of self-autonomy right now within how they're um, choosing to present themselves. And you mentioned country marks, um, which are very cool because as the century progresses, we don't see them as much. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's uh, one of those things too that we see within runaway ads 
are uh, people who are wearing wigs. Mm -hmm. Either they've been in the habit of wearing wigs or they stole a wig on the road to self-liberation mm -hmm. in order to disguise themselves, which is awesome because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> got to get there somehow. Absolutely. Um, you see, um, by and large, especially for um, enslaved women, um, primarily, especially in domestic or urban settings, your hair is going to be covered. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a couple um, of examples on the table today. Um, we have a cap, um, which, is, which is definitely something that is, is, is more European. Um, mm -hmm. But we, you know, we see women of African descent wearing it. There's a famous um, print of Phyllis Wheatley that comes to mind. But also you see the, the head wrap. And so it's doing the same um, basic job of keeping um, hair out of the way, keeping it covered, um, keeping it clean. But it's something definitely um, that's much more tied to Africa, mm -hmm. um, the Caribbean. Um, you also see um, a market bonnet, um, which we see. And you can see this is the, the brim of it, actually. And it is called a market bonnet because it is something that you see um, on enslaved, but also free black women um, as they're selling um, things at market, vegetables, uh, chicken, um, eggs, what have you. You also see a lot of prints in the Caribbean of that. Um, so by and large, for the most part, your hair is, is, is covered when you're around um, slave owners and other, other white people. But from the descriptions, we can mm -hmm. see that even though hair is often covered when they're around owners. These owners um, mm -hmm. still know, um, you know what the hair looks like, the length, yep. the texture, um, the color down to, you know, I see some describing a gray streak mm -hmm. um, in the hair. So they're still um, aware of that. Um, the city presents a kind of um, closeness, and I say that just closeness as in physicality, mm -hmm. not in relationship, um, but a closeness that um, makes owners aware of these type of details. Absolutely. And echoing what Hope was speaking on, uh, Phyllis Wheatley was um, an enslaved individual who uh, was in Philadelphia and she was an author. But um, within like the diaspora in British North America during this time, uh, you're going to see a varied amount of different types of uh, head coverings for women of color. Uh, Agostina Brunius is another great example. Mm -hmm. um, and he was um, mostly um, in the, the uh, Indies, I believe. Yeah, right? I think yeah. Dominica and um, um, maybe St. Vincent yes, and another couple thank you. islands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we're going to see a, a varied array of head coverings, which is you know, really great for examining that. And then, of course, the Ten Yawn Laws in uh, Louisiana during the latter half of the 18th century and early 19th century for regulating black women's hair. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we have a varied array of uh, techniques for covering hair. We see a shift, too, uh, in hairdressing um, of traditional African hair care. So I have a little jar of pomatum here um, that is what uh, Europeans would use as well as uh, men and women uh, who are enslaved in dressing their hair. They obviously had to, you know, figure out different ways of caring for their hair. Um, so in West Africa, before they were kidnapped, they were using local um, flora, such as shea butter, mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool. The pomatum that we're using today is based out of animal fat. So it is uh, a lard of some sort, generally mixed with tallow um, and sometimes beeswax. Mm -hmm. And it's very moisturizing. And we see this um, a lot, especially um, in runaway ads um, for women. We're using uh, the pomatum, or as we, mm -hmm. we say, pomade. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, where um, it's, it's, it's dressed up um, over a roll um, to, to mimic sometimes European styles, but kind of to add their own twists mm -hmm. um, to, these, to these styles that they're mimicking. Um, so that's something that you see um, mentioned a lot in runaway ads. Absolutely. And within uh, men and women using pomatum or pomade, um, those individuals within Williamsburg during this period 
um, who are enslaved are being trained, and this is men that I'm speaking of, uh, are being trained as barbers. So the most well-known example I can think of would be uh, William Lee, who mm-hmm. was George Washington's enslaved manservant. Um, and Lee was trained in a variety of skills and trades. So not only barbering and hairdressing, but he was a skilled shoemaker as well. So Washington, having never worn a wig a day in his life, uh, had his hair dressed daily by William Lee mm-hmm. um, using powder and pomatum. And that's um, something that you, that you see, you mentioned for, for William Lee, that it was one of many um, skills that he um, had um, in looking at um, runaway ads that, that specifically list people um, and all men as, as being barbers. Um, mm-hmm. For the most part, barbering was just one of several skills um, that these individuals had. A lot of them um, were waiting men or, or, or valets who served usually gentry men, mm-hmm. um, kind of as their right hand going everywhere with them. Um, but some of them, you know, they're, they're, they're barbering, but they also put their hand to a plow, or like you mm-hmm. said, shoemaking, <laughs> or um, doing some, some other tasks. Skilled so in was, writing, yeah, you this know, was to this was, aid the, their owner. Yeah, this was one of many things um, mm-hmm. that they were required and that they were expected to do. And another individual uh, in Williamsburg was Bob, who was owned by a physician in town uh, who was probably... Um, one of the only Jewish people in town during that time was John D. Sequera. Uh, he paid Edward Charlton, a prominent wig maker, um, uh, four pounds on March 6th of 1770 to, uh, quote, um, train Negro Bob in dressing and barbering. Um, so four pounds is a, is a goodly sum. That's almost two months of a skilled working tradesperson's income. So it is uh, a a skill that most um, valets or uh, men waiting upon the gentry would be, you know, expected to possess. If they didn't have it beforehand, they would be trained. Yeah, and you see, um, also there's a runaway ad um, of a Charles who runs from Loudoun County, and um, his owner says that um, Charles is known in Virginia, North Carolina, and Maryland um, for his skill in barbering, so so possibly because Charles was so talented um, and skilled, it's something that he did not only for uh, the man that owned him, but for other people mm-hmm. in his circle and kind of big circle. You know, thinking of the time, I think it was 1780. So he's somebody who's known in three different states um, for for his skill in barbering. That's impressive. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> even today, before you know social media, people mm-hmm. are known for their their skill with barbering. Um, and that's, that's, you know, I think a, a really cool thing that translates across time mm-hmm. are those who were skilled with a comb or a razor, you know, um, because, yeah. Yeah. The, and um, once that's a, a skill you know and it's something that, that you do or are required to do for an owner, it could be something potentially that you, you do for yourself. I think we have an image of barbers yeah. um, in yeah. Norfolk yep. um, that um, one is just a good picture of, of something that's just a, l- a little bit past our time period. 1797. It's still 18th century. It's still 18th century. <laughs> um, that kind of shows um, kind of that pompadour with the long mm-hmm. hair um, in the back. But these are, you know, these black men who are doing this um, for them for themselves. And for know. each other. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. That's that's a way to show community and care, um, mm-hmm. if, especially if you're being oppressed, is caring for not only your physical body, but those around you. So helping your friend shave, um, you know, possibly braiding or trimming the back of your neck. The skill, things that we can't do ourselves yeah. <laughs> too well sometimes, and it's mm-hmm. nice to have someone help you with. Yeah, um, yeah. and I you wonder, know. you know, were they going to, to, to a gathering uh, amongst themselves. Mm-hmm. That's something else um, you see with, with enslaved people, by and large, just the nature of, of work um, that especially enslaved women are doing, their hair is usually gonna be covered. Um, but um, underneath that head wrap mm-hmm. um, or cap, we see um, women braiding hair um, or wrapping it with um, strips of cloth um, or eel skin. Yeah. And then when they had just a bit of time for themselves, um, the head wrap or cap would come off 
and mm -hmm. you know the braids um, or the fabric or eel skin would be unwrapped to, to reveal these curls. So usually maybe Saturday evenings when the work slows down a bit. Um, and then probably that Sunday night, they'd wrap it, braid it, and then yeah. put it up again for the week. Yeah. And as the 18th century progresses into the 19th century, enslaved individuals aren't being allotted as much time to physically care for themselves uh, as their owners are, you know, maximizing uh, the, the profit that they're making off of them. Um, so we tend to see that shift. Um, would you pull up the image of old Alec, please? Yeah, this is a great image, and it actually kind of mirrors this livery wig next to me. Um, Alex has his hair kind of up in a pump, uh, and it is a cue in the back or a braid, uh, and which is a popular style uh, during the 18th century. Uh, and it's, it's easier for people who have curly hair, mm -hmm. so black folks and black Virginians uh, and, you know, those within British North America during this time. Um, white people get jealous kind of because it takes uh there's a whole process to getting straight hair uh to behave in this way so it's a heat process you have to uh, use curling implements along with that powder and pomatum so i think recognizing that is important as well yeah. that uh the language surrounding black hair is often degrading those people of color while white men and women are trying to get their hair into very uh, tight curls, yeah. uh, especially in the 1780s. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Alec is able to recreate the same style we see here naturally. Yep. So that <laughs> easily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Folks, if you have any questions, please send them in. We are more than happy to take them for you. Um, I'm just happy to be here and talk about hair. <laughs> We've got a number of, of questions coming in. Oh, First, good. a couple about um, sort of styles. Uh, Amanda was wondering if if Africans would or African Virginians would wear locks in the 18th century. I haven't found that express definition of locks in the 18th century. Um, have you hope? I haven't seen the word actually. Yeah. Um, I have seen um, references to, to men having um, very long hair, um, braided um, hair, braided out or braided down. I haven't seen the word locks as, as we think about it today. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it would be a stretch to think yeah. that that style um, would have existed at this time period. Sounds Good like question. we've got some more research to do. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So Brandon was curious about if in colonial times um, uh, there was anything similar to the weave that many black women and other people would wear today. As far as weaves, you're referencing where the hair is generally being braided down and track sewn in, I'm assuming. Uh, we do have hair attachments that are readily available in the 18th century. Uh, and that's what we see men and women of mm -hmm. European descent wearing. Uh, so you can actually blend, um, and this is referencing European, folks of European descent. Um, you would do a custom blend of hair and do a color match to the individual's head so it would blend in relatively naturally. Um, for instance, women during the 18th century uh, were finding that it is the exception rather than the rule that they wore wigs in the event that they did. It's kind of like a prosthesis. They've lost their hair to injury or illness. Women are adding hair attachments to their hair. Uh, just the application of it is different. Um, so really, yes, but not, it's not being you know, applied in the same way that we're doing it today. And I think about the enhancements, um, like we mentioned earlier, um, something like um, a roll. Mm -hmm. So what it would probably be most com comparable to today would be like a donut when yeah. um, you have the, the, little, the little bun that you, you want to have neat and tight. Um, that's kind of how the roll would function. And um, also, just as sometimes if a man can afford a whole wig, he might mm -hmm. just buy the cue, which is, is the braid. Um, I know for one of the characters I portray, um, there is a braid. So when I'm mm -hmm. portraying this woman, um, I brush my hair back and then I put the braid on. So the braid is what you see. And then there's the cap. So that's something that's going to be um, a 
a little more cost effective than exactly. a whole wig, but it gives you that same look. So I would say maybe not weaves, but enhancements. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Mm -hmm. And it's something that uh, working tradeswomen would be able to afford mm -hmm. uh, as an easy accessory, ultimately. Um, wigs like that you see here, this could be a part of someone's livery, uh, so a part of their uniform, essentially. But those hair attachments, those switches, buns, curls, braids, um, would maybe cost around 12 shillings. So it's within the realm of being readily affordable and available to individuals who wish to purchase them. Mm -hmm. Great question. Jay and Katie each had different questions about braiding things like shells or seeds into hair. Uh, Jay mentioned he sees that sometimes at Colonial Williamsburg, was wondering if that was an 18th century practice or a modern affectation. Uh, and then Katie was curious about, or had heard about seeds being, uh, you know, basically braided into hair when someone was taken from Africa and brought over here. Mm -hmm. We were talking um, yeah. a little bit uh, about that um, earlier before the broadcast about um, the, there's a notion that um, braids were braided in such a way to, to provide maps or directions for people. Um, who were seeking to self-liberate. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not something that, that, that I have seen. I've heard the same thing um, about seeds. It's nothing um, that, that I've seen. Has, I um, haven't found any mm -hmm. primary documentation regarding seeds being braided into hair. However, that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't exist. Uh, and the references that we were discussing earlier mm -hmm. uh, regarding hair being braided in a manner that it's you know essentially a map, all of those have come out of Colombia and mm -hmm. uh, South America. So it's not something that I you know, can speak with authority on, uh, but once again, great question, and I would really like to look into that more. I have seen um, instances of um, beads and uh, shells uh, found at, at burial sites, mm -hmm. but from um, the way these objects were discovered, there, there are some that are um, discovered, maybe one of, but um, beads typically tended to, to be worn a, a, about the body. Um, so again, not to say that, you know, this isn't something that mm -hmm. happened where they were, were braided in hair, but that is the evidence. And um, several sites um, in and around Colonial Williamsburg, um, uh, beads and cowrie shells were found. Yeah, mm -hmm. which, you know, that's another great topic for a live stream, I think, because, you know, as, you know, traditions, you know, you're trying to retain that, uh, link to Africa. So, mm -hmm. yeah, great mm -hmm. questions, guys. Earlier, you were speaking of different hair, head coverings, um, and, and Doug mentioned uh, that he had heard that uh, from a friend that turbans or head wraps were used sometimes uh, or to oppress um, in, enslaved people. Is that true? Uh, Absolutely. Um, Going back, when you are, you know, a free person in Africa um, and you're kidnapped and you're stolen from your homeland, the first thing that they do is shave your head and they strip any autonomy that you might have. They're stripping cultural traditions from you. Um, and that, you know, hair within the African diaspora represents a lot. It can represent your marital status. It mm -hmm. can represent if you're a warrior. It can represent so many different varied things. So especially within New Orleans uh, mm -hmm. and the Teen Young Laws that come about in the early 19th century, that repression kind of backfires yeah. on the enslavers, <laughs> which is really great because these uh, women of um, African origins are like, okay, you're going to make me cover my hair because you're jealous of it. All right, um, so they start decorating their teen yawns mm -hmm. and wearing silk and very fine uh, fabrics and putting feathers and jewels, and that tradition still kind of maintains um, itself today mm -hmm. within that vibrant culture of Louisiana and New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so they turn the law on its head. Mm -hmm. And there's some really good um, images. Um, there's, there's a website that we'll direct you to, um, but there's some really good images um, of women in New Orleans, more 19th century, but, um, but check those out. Some beautiful, beautiful wraps. Yeah, I can mm -hmm. post a link later to uh, some images as well uh, of free couples. I think there's a free couple up in Philadelphia. I'll post a link once I can remember it. 
we earlier speaking about barbering and mentioned um, that that skill certainly crossed color lines. You'd see enslaved people, or free black people, as, as well as white men doing this work. What about women um, uh, of either, any race? Uh, were they doing barbering, or were, was there a, a professional um, sort of version of, of hair care? Were there women professionals, I guess? Diane was, was curious about this. You do see ladies' maids, especially in the European tradition, who were trained in barbering, or not barbering, in hairdressing. Um, barbering and really wig making in and of itself, it's a masculine fashion and it's a masculine trade. So it's kind of funny that today our <laughs> shop is run completely yeah. by women, um, but we have a lot of fun. Um, so not, I haven't found references to female barbers within Williamsburg, really British North America. Um, what we do see are hairdressing schools um, pop up uh, in France um, during um, the reign of, uh, actually Marie Antoinette's hairdresser um, opened up a hairdressing school. Uh, so that they would be able to um, train these younger individuals in um, dressing the bourgeoisie's hair. But it's, the, the skills are possessed, but they might not enter into a formal trade like we would think of it today. Like you go to cosmetology school, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, I think um, studying um, ladies' maids, um, you see the same thing uh, for, for these enslaved women that it was one of several skills they had when they waited upon um, usually gentry or upper middle class women where mm -hmm. they um, dressed hair, but they were also good with a needle, a washer, an iron, uh, iron or a spinner, mm -hmm. um, what have you. But um, never, never barbering, never using yeah. a razor. Mm -hmm. And then that once again goes back to these enslaved individuals uh, being trained in numerous skills and trades uh, so as to maximize the owner's profit pretty much. Um, so if you're, you're skilled or gifted with a needle or a comb, then fantastic. A question from Laura about how often would people wash their hair? And maybe we can also expand that to be, how would people wash their hair? Awesome question, Laura, thank you. Um, so obviously we're not going to shampoo and condition as frequently as we do today. And then we are discussing the enslaved and free blacks within Williamsburg. I don't have a great answer for you, honestly. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times a week I wash my hair. I don't record those tasks. I wish people did, mm -hmm. so I could give you a definite answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one of those things that um, we don't know. Um, the, the documentation is something you know that doesn't, that doesn't reflect that, and it might be one of those things that's just so common um, mm -hmm. that, that it wouldn't um, be, be written down. I would say hair maintenance mm -hmm. would happen on a daily basis. Absolutely. Um, so whether it's just, just putting it up, um, uh, braiding, um, tying, what have you, hair maintenance would happen every day. But, you know, the washing is, is hard to say, probably and, as needed, and it's going to yeah. vary depending upon where you are. Um, Your are access you more, to water. Yeah, you urban or, or rural, mm -hmm. are you more um, domestic? Um, are working in the field, so it would, yeah. it would vary. Regarding uh, those of European descent um, who, you know, don't maintain their hair, uh, in, such as, you know, those of African descent would, um, generally within our shop, we wash our wigs with Castile soap. It's an olive oil-based soap. But once again, that's, you know, maintaining the European tradition. So mm -hmm. I can't give you an exact answer on what those... Um, with African descent, how they would wash their hair. I, I want to know now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess after we wash our hair, we have to brush it. Um, Lynn was curious about, speaking of textures of hair, when were combs for curly texture hair for women and men of color available, and what were they made of? <sighs> That's going to go, really. <laughs> we're going to skip to the 19th century right now. Mm -hmm. um, because they weren't readily available. Um, people had to improvise with mm -hmm. what they w had readily available. We do have some bone combs right here. I don't know if you can see those or not. Um, but it's, um, 
Yeah, really with uh, the advent of the hot comb in the 19th century mm -hmm. and the, um, you know, really specific marketing towards black Americans and just black folks all over the world, um, that's when we see, you know, hair care products really come into play. Yeah, and, um, and another way in which um, people of African descent are adapting, I have seen um, references talk about um, people using cards oh, yeah. um, to, comb, to comb their hair um, because that was probably the only thing that was readily mm -hmm. available. You can see with the comb how um, the spacing isn't necessarily wide enough for hair that has a texture um, or a coil to it, but cards, yeah. and when I say cards, um, it is how, how wool is, is, is carded um, before it's spun. I have seen references um, of those being used yeah. um, for hair. Mm -hmm. A question from Adam, he's wondering if, um, white men or women were, uh, were ever known to style or dress uh, the hair of African Virginians? That's a great that question. A good question. I don't know. Um, within um, Edward, or the, the Charlton account book that we have, we know um, that, say, if there was a ball or a party at the governor's palace, um, Oftentimes, the serving staff for that would have their hair dressed or they would be in livery wigs. Um, I haven't found documentation of a person of color having their hair dressed in that capacity, per se. Um, what I have seen is, once again, going back to white barbers and wig makers training black enslaved people in their trade. Yeah, That's and I think really by, by way of um, reading um, wigs or, or hair pieces for, for balls or for company or what mm -hmm. have you, um, they would be servicing the wigs of these um, usually enslaved black people, but like a black person sitting in a chair or a shop and their hair being, being dressed by a white person. It's not anything I've come across, yeah. but like I said, it's, it's a lot to uncover. <laughs> we've got a lot to look for. Mm-hmm. Tina was asking about livery wigs, which, which you had just mentioned. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. So a livery wig is going to be a part of your uniform. Um, so if you're a butler or a footman, uh, if you are in uh, a driving a coach perhaps, um, that is part of your uniform. So the livery wigs uh, can be white or brown uh, or essentially any color that you wanted. But the most predominant colors seem to be white and brown. Mm -hmm. um, really, the imported hair that we would be using during the 18th century to create white wigs most likely will be horse hair in this instance. Um, and white hair is typically harder, uh, not harder, but it, it tends to be more expensive, whether it's horse or human hair, because of the parameters that we set around purchasing it. Um, so yeah, it could uh, have these buckles on the side that you see here. This just happens to be a white livery wig with a small pomp or pompadour and uh, three side buckles with a silk bag on the end. And those silk bags that you see on wigs really are going to be there. Uh, upon when they first came into you know, fashion, it was more of a practical item because we would be powdering the hair with that powder and pomatum, and it was used to protect the exterior garment. So if you've got a cue hanging down, that is going to sometimes rub powder off. As the century progresses, oftentimes these silk bags get larger, uh, sometimes to comical proportions in satirical prints. So look those up, those are cool. Um, but it's just, it, it kind of just becomes an accessory to the accessory, I think mm -hmm. is a, a nice way to put it. Diane was curious about the evolution and changing in, in fashion for, for hair. Uh, do we see that among enslaved people? Certainly we see for, you know, for white folks, we see changes in fashion for all kinds of things and certainly hair style among them. Do we, do we see that among enslaved people? I would think, think you do. Um, just again, just 
fashion and style is going to change. So mm -hmm. we saw like with the picture um, of um, Alec, you know, his hair mimicking the style of, of, of a livery wig. So it's, it's going to be something that happens with, you know, influencing happening um, um, on both sides. I think it's going to depend on functionality as well. Um, like we mentioned, for a lot of enslaved people, um, especially women, your hair is, is going to be covered, and that's going to be true throughout the history um, of enslavement for most of the jobs that most um, enslaved women um, are doing. Um, for men, you might see um, a little more evidence of that. And when you look at, it's usually sketches, it's sketches in the 18th century, but as you begin to look in the 19th century um, with sketches and, and, and photography, you do see mm -hmm. um, some of the, the hairstyles um, as they change with the waves, um, with the parts, mm -hmm. um, with, with facial hair especially yeah. um, being a little different. Um, so, so absolutely, you do see that um, change and adjust over time. And, you know, in addition to from, say, year to year, or decade to decade, what about from season to season? You know, Christian, and I'm sure you, you get this question mm -hmm. a lot, Edith, um, but was wondering about, oh gosh, you know, how, how do people, gentry in particular, deal with summer heat in Virginia and wigs? But just speak to, everybody loves our Virginia summer. <laughs> um, how is that, is that impacting length of hair and style of hair and so forth? Absolutely, great question, Christian. Um, so summertime in Virginia, in the Tidewater, it's hot. It is Humid. something <laughs> that the Virginians adapted to relatively quickly. Uh, they adopted or adapted their wardrobe um, from you know what they were initially bringing over from England. Uh, and actually, uh, Neil Hurst, curator at the museum, art museum, wrote a fantastic paper on it. Uh, for the heat is beyond their comprehension, sorry, um, if I mess that up. Um, with the, the wearing of wigs in the gentry class, one of the things that we really like to do is shave your head completely bald because that gives us the best fit possible. We take a measurement uh, of your shaven head and have a wood carver turn a blockhead for you. That's your custom blockhead. So it's not uncommon actually to see uh, men with shaven heads in mm -hmm. Williamsburg in the 18th century. We see portraits of men in kind of a state of undress where they're wearing a wrapping gown and with a shirt underneath and perhaps like a, a cap on top, uh, which is like just an unstructured cap. Um, so we see that within portraiture. Um, and I, th I think we all adapt to the heat to the best that we can here within uh, Williamsburg in the 21st century as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So here we are in the 21st century and you both taken time to, sh to share things with us today based on the research that you're doing. Could you speak to some of the sources that are, you use, some of the ways you go about trying to uncover a, a topic that's not necessarily written about directly like military campaigns are and so mm -hmm. forth so for, for folks that are watching you know how can they sort of discover some of this information for themselves too um, I would say to, to mine the sources that you do have um, available to you mm -hmm. um, a lot of the things that we um, have access to by being a part of the museum you know are, are things that a lot of people don't have access yeah. to, but there are some really good sites, um, the geography of slavery, slavery images. So when you, when you look at these descriptions um, of people and you can go to, to, to runaway ads for, for a lot of different things, whether it's dialect, um, languages people spoke, um, instruments they played. But mm -hmm. for us, there are, there are a lot of mentions of hair, texture, facial hair, what have you. And there, there are prints um, which are remarkable resources um, as well because they give us detail mm -hmm. into to, to things like, I keep going to Alec about how he, yeah. his, his natural hair is doing what, what this wig is doing of the, the Brunios paintings that um, show women um, and men who, who were living in the Caribbean and, and the styles um, that were there. Um, go to, to go to good documented <laughs> secondary yeah. sources. Um, so I know um, one book that um, I go to a lot is Stylin yeah, but... by Shane and Graham White. Absolutely. So that touches from 18th all the way to early 20th century up to the, to the zoot suit 
and you can tell how good a, a book is, is researched by checking the footnotes or endnotes. Yeah. So that'll give you some indication as to how, how well researched it is. Absolutely. Um, if you have access to JSTOR uh, yeah. through your institution mm -hmm. or even your community college, um, there are a wonderful array of peer-reviewed papers on there uh, regarding mm -hmm. uh, hair not only of the uh, free black and enslaved individuals within British North America and other parts of the world, but also American Indian uh, individuals within North America, which is really great. The one thing I would mention too is that when you are viewing these resources, mm -hmm. they're not gonna be happy. These people were stolen from their homeland and they were enslaved. And we are viewing these resources, uh, especially with runaway ads, mm -hmm. for those who are trying to reclaim their property. So it's very, uh, hard sometimes to look at these resources, uh, especially if you, you know what you're going to come across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just be aware of the lens yeah. um, at what you're, what you're looking at these things um, through. We get a lot of information that's useful to us in the 21st century, but at the expense of, of these people. Um, trying to self-liberate. So it's, yeah. it's invaluable information, but just always be aware and cognizant of why we have it. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. Again, sort of bringing us into the 21st century. Uh, when we look at the way that people talk about, think about um, African hair uh, mm -hmm. in colonial America or... or and, and beyond, what's, what's the legacy of all of that? How, how, how do we still live with that? I think um, slavery, <laughs> colonialism, um, it does cast um, a long shadow. I think about um, things that are still happening today mm -hmm. um, in the 21st century, um, in, in 2021, where there are, are, are students who are in jeopardy of, of losing scholarships, not being able to graduate, not being able to attend school because of the way they wear their hair, mm -hmm. locked, um, afros, um, natural. Um, I think of countless black actresses who have talked about um, hair being damaged um, by hairdressers um, on sets, whether movies, TV shows, or as models who, mm -hmm. you know, who have people on set who don't know how to to take care of and maintain the hair of black people or how they have to incur personal expenses just to ensure that their hair stays healthy um, and is, is, is done in a proper way, a, a fashionable way, a healthy way um, for these. So it's, it's something that, that it, society still <laughs> yeah. um, does, does not deal with in the way that it needs to be dealt with. <laughs> And the language surrounding uh, black hair today, if you have good mm -hmm. hair, mm -hmm. and what is that, the, the expense of that? Sometimes it's, you know, genetics. Sometimes it's um, chemical processing where, you know, if you go in to get your hair strained, you run the risk of getting your scalp burned. And that's not uncommon. So the language that we use surrounding hair, I think it just needs to be hair. Mm -hmm. All hair is good. And I think in, in spite of all that, um, uh, black women remain ever resilient. There's, there's, there's never been a time when there have been um, more companies usually black owned or, or specifically focused on um, black hair and the, the complexities, the different textures, yeah. um, colors, um, what have you. So um, we're, we're, we're gonna be resourceful. We're gonna take care, care of ourselves. And um, that, that always happens. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, Hope and Edith, thank you both so thank much you. for joining us today and sharing your passion and insight and knowledge about this complex topic. All of you watching and, and asking questions, thank you as well. Of course, this and all of our programs are made possible by the generosity of our donors. To learn how you can support presentations like this, follow the link pinned to the comments below or join us at colonialwilliamsburg.org. 
Um, in a couple of weeks, hope you will be back with us uh, in the milliner's shop. I we'll will. We'll be talking about, uh, <laughs> so, again, runaway ads, some of the clothing uh, that, that, uh, that we see mentioned in those. Again, Edith and Hope, thank you. And do you all have some thank final you. thoughts to send us on our way today? Thank you for joining us. Uh, we couldn't be here without the support of our donors. Uh, I hope our passion, you know, showed through because we do love what we do. Um, yeah, you thank hope. you for joining us, yeah. and we hope that you get a chance to um, check out those resources. Um, come and check us out um, on site when, when you're able to, and it's, it's safe to do so. And um, keep looking to uncover new things out there. I know we are. Absolutely. <laughs>